Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground, I'm your host, Ashley Hall. On this week's episode of Common Ground, Paula Jensen of Guthrie shows us the making of an owl sculpture. The daughters of the late David Park share their personal stories about growing up in the David Park house in Bemidji. And finally, we visit with Ray Tahalski of Avon, who celebrates the history of Minnesotan culture by researching and collecting antique fishing lures. I'm Ray Tucholsky from Avon, Minnesota, and I have two passions. One is wood turning and the other is fishing. So I've combined both of my passions into one activity. Uh, I invented this uh, pedal lathe a number of years ago. Uh, so I, and this accomplishes several things. One, I get my exercise. And uh, two, I get my fishing lures. So, uh, I can sit here and pedal and get my lures. I replicate most of the old lures that you'd probably find in Grandpa's tackle box or Great Grandpa. The history of fishing is, is quite interesting. The lures and the fishing, that how we do it today, has only been in existence less than 100 years. and. Uh, I'm going to uh, probably start by replicating the old Bassarino. And this lure was first made in 1916. So every time I do one blank, I'll get two lures. And I give these lures to kids to get them interested in fishing. And an average year, you'll give away about 1,500, 1,600. We put these lures in a little kit form. And in each kit, we have the lure, the hooks, the hardware, and the eyes. And the finished product looks like this. It's the same lure, and it's the same colors that the original Bassarino were made. A gentleman by the name of James Hedden was sitting on the riverbank about 1915 and had a jackknife and a twig and he was whittling it and waiting for a friend of his. His friend came up and he threw the whittled twig in the river and a fish came up and grabbed the twig and it looked very similar to, the, to his Bassarino so he went back and he started manufacturing the wooden bassarinos, and they're an excellent bait for bass. The bassarinos were actually made in different sizes, and I have here a larger one, but this one was actually made in 1916, and it was one of the first, and the reason I know the date on it is because of the glass eyes, and they only put the glass eyes in in two or three years, then they just painted the eyes on it. Appearance, and as I say, this one is quite old. This is another one, and it looks a lot older, but in fact, it was made back in the 30s because of the painted eyes and the way it was made. So the appearance isn't necessarily how you would date one. You date them by the hardware, the eyes, and the color. There was probably more Bassarinos made and sold than any other lure ever made to this date. And the most popular was the red and whites. For some reason, red and white lures have always been one of the most popular. 
a lot of the lures that I replicate, and even though they may look like the old lures, I don't paint. I do paint some, but a lot of them that, that I make, I leave natural. Here is a jitterbug that I made. It's a replica. It was made in the 30s by a gentleman by the name of Fred Abagast. And the reason I don't paint mine is because the natural wood in the water looks more like a real fish or a minnow. And I've always felt, and this is not an original thought, that the lures that are sold today are designed more to catch the fishermen than they are the fish. They look real pretty, but I don't think they catch any more fish than it. the old lures that were made 75 to 100 years ago. I personally believe that action of lures are what catches more fish than the color. I think color is somewhat important, but the action is so much more important than the color. And that's why most of my, my wooden lures I don't finish. There was a gentleman called Julia Burl, and he probably manufactured the very first for sale fishing lure. And actually it was a fishing spoon. And he manufactured it by taking one of his wife's spoons from the table, cutting the handle off and uh, painting it, drilling a couple holes in the end and making the very first spoon. All of our spoons today derive from this tablespoon that Julia Burrow made. That is the daredevils that we know today derive from it or the five diamonds that most people fish with. I'd like to take a few minutes now if uh, you bear with me and actually make one of the spoon lures. Okay, well here's a spoon that uh, you don't want to invite me to your house for dinner because you might lose a few spoons now and then. But uh, I, uh, I'll go ahead and make one of the spoon lures and basically all you'll, you need to do is take a chisel, cold chisel, and now I'm going to walk over here and I drilled two holes. The holes I put in plus the end that I cut off is fairly sharp. You sure don't want anything sharp because it'll cut your line. So I use a powder paint, which is sort of like baked on porcelain. And to use it, you put a little heat on your spoon. If you get too much, it'll bubble. If you don't get enough, it won't stick. And then I spread the powder paint on the spoon. This is hot, and I'm gonna let it cool just a minute. And you'll start it on your lure, put your hook on it. And basically the split ring pliers just open the split ring. and you're ready to go fishing. Any lure can catch a fish. And I, I give a little illustration here. This is nothing more than a, a bottle cap. You can take a house key, put a slight bend in it, and it swims like the daredevil. This is the handle of the spoon. And of course, I, I, we made and I showed you the spoon. Uh, this lure here is uh, made out of a piece of hand bone. And again, the shape is like the daredevil, swims like the daredevil. The twig is actually a replica of the very first bassarino that James Hedden carved and threw in the river and uh, uh, attracted the bass. So anything can catch fish if you present it right and you don't need to spend a ton of money at your big sporting goods 
stores to have successful fishing. My name is Paula Jensen and I'm a metal sculptor and I'm here to tell you how I made this great gray owl. I went to BSU to Diane Morris. They have a great gray owl mount there and they, they allowed me to take measurements and get photographs and really study what the bird looked like. Then I went home and proceeded to create and I started with the face because my thought is, is when you look at somebody or something, you're always looking at the eyes first. And I bought some floral foam so that I could carve the face into that. It was really easy to carve and I get a more three-dimensional feel for what was going on with the face. Once I was satisfied with that, then I went back out to the shop, made the eyes out of brass and stainless steel, built a bronze weld around the eyes and started carving. For the feathers around the face, I built weld up and then took a cutting wheel and cut just on one side of the weld to create a shadow all the way around. And then I took a die grinder and carved the feathers in. To do the beak, I took bronze sheet metal and hammered a cone on a wood stump in order to bend it right. And then I did the same thing with the bottom part of the beak and I put them together like this and I shaped it with a die grinder then afterwards. I created uh, a fan-like or crescent shape and I took a, a cutting wheel and I cut the feathers in. But I wouldn't cut it all the way down to the other side. So I had a bit to weld to onto the face. Once I got that in place and I ground down my welds, then I put another layer, the same thing, so, that, so then you had this, this type of, a, of an effect. You have a layering effect, so there's, it looks like there's more feathers there than, than actually is there. The head, I'd form it so it was a bit rounded, and then I'd weld it to the back of the face. I had some feathers out this way so I could hide my weld in the back of the face. I had planned on building the whole head with a hole in it, and putting the face in, but that didn't work out. So I just basically just added pieces, and then I'd build weld up on those pieces, and then carve those so they looked like feathers. Once I was pretty much happy with the head, then I had to start working on the chest. And I did that in a whole nother complete piece. I just set the head aside and hammered the sheet metal chest so that it, it kind of looked like an owl chest. And then I'd build up weld on that in feather shapes and then carve it out with a, with a uh, cutting wheel. I had been using a die grinder, but I found that I didn't get the detailing that I like. So a cutting wheel worked best. When I studied the owl, I found out that the largest that they had found was 33 inches tall. So that was my aim, was to go for 33 inches tall. and I figured out, well, I looked at the photographs on, on the internet and I figured out, okay, if the head is a third of the body, then that kind of gave me the proportions. How I discovered what the shapes of the great gray owl's feathers were like, there's information on the internet if you do a search on great gray owl feathers or great gray owl feet or any of that, there's studies out there where uh, scientists have taken the measurements and taken photographs. So you can get all that information on the internet. I'm such a visual person, that's how I understand things. If I don't understand the measurements of the beak, if I don't understand the measurement of the head, if I don't understand that he's 33 inches tall, you know, from, from head to tail, I could end up with an owl that's, that's proportionally wrong. So you have to get that into your head and, and understand it. And the only way to do that is to study, study a little bit. The whole sculpture weighs approximately 150 pounds. Most people that hire me to do private commissions know specifically or pretty close to what they want. Public commissions, you have several people you have to satisfy. Safety is, is the main concern. In this instance, 
I knew I didn't have to worry about how sharp things were because I knew it was going to be up where people couldn't touch it. In public, you have to be concerned about how many people are going to touch it. Um, you know, are they going to get cut? Um, so you have to you have to be concerned about all that. The reason why my clients wanted a great gray owl um, was they came home one day and the lights of their vehicle had shone on their sculpture, the crane sculpture, and there was a great gray owl sitting there checking out the frogs around their pond. And it looked back at them and they thought, wow, that, that would be a really cool sculpture. So that's why this was commissioned. Hi, we're the Park Sisters and we grew up in the David Park House. My father is David J.M. Park. His parents are from Ireland. They came over here, I think, at the turn of the century. I'm not sure exactly when. And Mary, his mother, had three brothers from Ireland who set up a, a grocery chain out east. My uncle Bob, his older brother and his other brother, Uncle Bill, heard about a creamery who was, which was for sale in Bemidji, Minnesota. So they helped my dad coming up here and start in the creamery business. That was probably in 1926 or 25. He was in business for, what, eight years before they decided to build this house, the park house. My dad had said to my mother, in 10 years, you will have the home that I want, you know, our family to have. The house was poured concrete and they did it with, with, they built forms and then poured the concrete. I kind of watched the, the building of the, the David Park house and uh, I was not too happy. It was like, I'm moving into a hotel. <laughs> So, but uh, anyway, and it was only two and a half blocks away from my original house, but I still felt like I'm not home now. <laughs> I lived here until I went away to college. After I graduated from, from Bemidji High School in 1946, my mother only lived in this house from 19... 37 until 1941, and then she passed away. For me, it was not real, not a real happy time because my mother was sick. And, and then right, at, right, at, right after she passed away, the war started. And, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't drive the car like, you know, most teenagers do today. <laughs> and, uh, so, and there was rationing and, and you know, it was, a, it was a whole different era. I have two brothers, one was older and one was younger. Uh, my, my older brother was 13 months older than me and my younger brother was seven years younger than me. So he was born in 1935. I think it's hard for uh, kids to live in a house like this, which is beautiful and everything, but you know, you almost have to prove yourself and you always have to be a little bit nicer to everybody. And because I had a friend in high school that said to me, you know, you're really pretty nice. You're not a snob at all. <laughs> and and that that's hard. And I think Mary went through that too. So uh, if I had my druthers, I would have rather been in a little more modest home. <laughs> when I was born in 1950, this is the house I came into. And I believe my nursery was the, what's now the guest room, or what was always the guest room, okay. until, until I took over your bedroom, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the girls' room. I remember coming down in the morning and finding strange people in the house wandering around and I'd say, can I help you? And they'd go, 
which building is this? <laughs> now it is part of the college. <laughs> but back then, they thought it was part of the college, and they just walk in and wander around. But, but Daddy loved the house. Yeah, right. right. And he did. He would, he would be really happy when people would rap on the door and say, oh, it's such a pretty house. Can we look around? And he'd show them around. Didn't matter if I was right. sleeping in my bedroom. <laughs> he'd show them the room. So, yeah, well, it was different. And yet, it was home. For me, it was yeah, home. Yeah. You know, it wasn't any different when people would say, what was it like to grow up there? It was home. What was it like to grow up in your house? You know, it was the same. I remember going down to the creamery. It was always fun to, to go in because I'd go to the ice cream room where they made the ice cream sandwiches and I'd want to help them dip them and then I'd double dip them because I knew they'd make me bring them home. <laughs> Look, I found some things from the creamery. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh. I Here's a... You know, I have looked for these, for one of these at oh. some of the antique places and I have never found one. I do have the cup. And look at the year on this. 19. The year I was born. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The ice cream place, it was David Park Company, but it was luxury ice cream. And he had 36 stores mm -hmm. in a five state area. We were talking last night about Halloween, and every Halloween they would pass out ice cream bars. And the kids used to go to the front door and get an ice cream bar, eat the ice cream bar, and run around to the back and get one at the back door, too. Now, we had probably one of the first uh, dishwashers, and it opened up the top. Like, you know, not like the ones today. And, and so if you were mad, you'd lift that top, and water would be spurting all over the house. You know, I mean, all over. I mean, that, that was one of our tricks that we did. But it was one of the first dishwashers that was probably ever made because it was like in the late 30s. You know, how many people had dishwashers? This was the bread drawer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, it good. still is. So it had a little bread box in it. And I think they used to keep flour and sugar in this one. Yeah, it's yeah, metal. Yeah, that's got tin. Yeah. And there was a pull-out, yep, still yep. here, to hang your dish towels on so they would dry. All the stainless steel trim that goes around the kitchen to match the Art Deco and the stainless steel in the cupboards. And here's the clothes chute that goes down to the basement, so when they had wet towels, they just throw them down there. Looks like they're using wires, using it for wires now, but. And there's another one upstairs, so you could just throw your sheets down. Here's the the what you were talking yeah. about with the neighbor kids swinging on. Yeah, the... there was a neighbor boy that that's you know got up and he was swinging on this, and my mother said, "Get off of that! You're going to break it." When I was a teenager, I was making popcorn out on the deck, and there was a couch over here, and I plugged it in right there to that outlet. And I was making popcorn, and I spilled corn oil on the stone and we couldn't get it up and it made it shiny and from then on they polished it with corn oil because it looked nice and made it a little bit sticky so it wasn't as slick. No, the, these light fixtures were imported from Sweden. There's a rumor that goes around that there was a movie star that lived in this house but untrue. <laughs> there was no movie star that lived here however Eleanor Roosevelt <coughs> was in the house. Mm -hmm. She came to town to give a talk at the college and my dad heard that there was no reception plan for her. She was staying down at the Markham Hotel that night and so after the talk that she gave, the lecture at the college, my dad invited everybody in town over to the house for a reception for her. I remember my mom saying that she was out at the country club playing bridge and she got a phone call and he said, you better go home. I just invited everybody in town over for a party. <laughs> so she came home to arrange the party. Now, this is rather amazing because my dad was a staunch, dyed-in-the-wool Republican. And of course, Eleanor was a Democrat. But she had become well-known, renowned 
for her speeches on getting along, and I don't remember all what she did do, but she was well, very and, well known. And she said, this is what makes America great, when the staunchest Republican in town will have a party for a staunch Democrat. <laughs> I remember being told not to touch the railings because the railing is brass and they have mm -hmm. to polish it. Mm -hmm. And I remember a party that my mom and dad had and I told all the guests not to touch the railing. <laughs> <laughs> because you couldn't, they I couldn't either. I was told not to touch the railing. So as I was escorting <laughs> people upstairs, they'd say, be sure not to put your hands on the railing. <laughs> you touch down here. <laughs> I think that a lot of the history is lost when it's not talked about or remembered. And having a building at least gives you something to remind you. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for common ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any common ground segment, visit us at lptv.org backslash common ground. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.